Newness Creativers presents a word for every generation that knows no fashion. Greetings. I hope and trust. I find you well, my dear friends. We have one more mountain experience as we are on the book of Joshua for the first and last time. Come with me to the book of Joshua. The chapter is 2 and we want to look at verse number 12. It reads as follows. Now then, I pray you, Swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house, and give me a sure sign, and save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all they have, and deliver us from death. And the man say to her, that is Rahab, our lives for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then... When the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the town wall so that she dwelt in the wall. Verse 16, And she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers have returned and afterward. You may go your way. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word as we spend a moment in prayer. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, the working week is about to start. We are going to enter into written and verbal agreements. How we pray, dear Lord, that you may reveal unto us the truth from your word that will equip us to deliver and be at our best. This has been our prayer of faith. Be with us. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. My good friends, allow me to raise five points as usual. Herein we want to consider in this devotional what I have termed the contract. We'll look at the principles of contract. Time does not allow, but I will give you snippets of these. And at point number one, we find Rahab in a contractual negotiation with the two spies that have been dispatched by Joshua. What does this tell us? Number one, it is a verbal agreement. It is not a written agreement. This does not mean verbal agreements are not binding, especially in the context of employment law. Verbal agreements are binding. They are contracts instead in their own right. A written contract is a matter of evidencing what has been agreed. In terms of business con contracts, and commercial contracts. Indeed, the law demands that these ought to be in writing. But in employment law, it is not necessary that these contracts be in writing. What is a contract? A contract is an agreement. It is a meeting of the minds. The Latin equivalent is consensus ad idem. So there must have been an agreement to begin with. So Rahab is entering a virtual agreement which is binding. That besides, at the end of verse 12, she goes on to say, and you are going to give me a sure sign. In our modern parlance, what is the sign of this agreement? The sign is that you ought to sign on the dotted line. The signature of the party is an agreement to a contract. So when we sign, what we do is we admit, we agree that we understand and are in agreement with what has preceded the signature. So as we go into the workspace, I know some of us are going to be signing contracts this week. Maybe this month you're starting at a new post. As you sign your employment contract, check the terms that precede your signature. Do not sign and then think about what you signed for. You think about it, then you sign for it. That is the principle, and that is common sense, by the way. Point number two, without much ado, look at verse 12 before we leave it again. She says unto this gentleman, pray, swear to me. You guys, I have been kind to you. I have shown you kindness. So what I simply ask, that you also will show kindness to my father's house. In contract language, there is what is known as a quid pro quo. A quid pro cure is the one that is in reverse. It says, do this for me and I will do this for you. Now, in this context, what we are looking at 
is an issue of duties and obligations. When one performs a duty, a contractual duty, they generate an obligation that corresponds to the duty. So what she says is, gentlemen, I have already done this kindness to you. Why don't you then show me an equivalent or a comparable kindness? This kindness is to accrue to my father's house. But maybe these gentlemen are going to say, we never had a contract to begin with. So if there was no contract to begin with, then it becomes a quid pro quo. I have done this. Do this for me. Point number three. Notice that as she goes on to negotiate her contract, she says, show kindness to my father's house. What is her father's house in contractual language? This is what we refer to, especially in insurance contracts, as the big print. The big print. She's having one condition. Show kindness to my father's house. It's a simple request. Simple as it is, it also has a fine print. What is this fine print? The fine print is the father's house is not defined. Go to verse 18 and you're going to realize that her father's house is number one, her father. Number two, her mother. Number three, her brothers. Number four, sisters. And number five, all they have, their property. And above all, what should happen? The subject of this contract is deliver us from death. That is what she's negotiating for, for the third parties to this contract. As she negotiates for the third parties to this contract, I want you to take note of this. Not only is she negotiating for third parties, when we go into contracts, we want to make sure we read the fine print. Number two, should we have to list our next of kin? This is where they come in so that they can enforce the contract in due course. Should anything happen to you as the principal party to the contract? As you make your contracts, strike deals that will cover third parties. Lesson number four. These gentlemen now respond and they say, our life for yours. These are men who want to sign for the contract with their lives. They give the guarantee. They give the assurance this contract is going to be carried out. And this is the sanctity of contract. People go into contracts because they know parties intend to be bound. Not only do they intend to be bound, but they avail themselves to the judicial processes to compel them to enforce the contracts that they have promised that they are going to enforce. Now, this is what these gentlemen say. They say, with our own lives. These would definitely come to pass. Who are these gentlemen in the context of contractual language? These gentlemen are what we consider as agents. When an agent enters a contract, he does so on behalf of his or her principal. In this case, who is the principal? God of Israel. Who is the other principal? Israel. The political Israel is going to ensure that they are delivered from death. The God of Israel will deliver them from death as we go into contracts as children of God. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. That is contractual language. Whatever we set loose on earth is loose in heaven. We are the agents of heaven. And secondly, these gentlemen in lesson number four, they say, provided you do not mention our business to anyone. What is this? We did cover this earlier. Go back to the devotional on Joshua and Aaron as he's taken up to go and die at the top of the mountain. We say these were non-disclosure agreements. Non-disclosure agreements have a timeline. Some will be binding for three years, some for five years, some will expire after 10. After those 10, 10 years, you can make it public what the agreement or the issues that were discussed could have been. So in this case, a non-disclosure agreement has been set up and it is as follows. You shall not divulge our business to any living soul. That is a non-disclosure agreement. But before we leave the non-disclosure agreement, the gentleman now set in what we call a suspensive clause. What is a suspensive clause? A suspensive clause, as we near the end, simply says, you are going to fulfill a certain element of the contract after a particular event has come to pass or after some time has lapsed. So these gentlemen say, when the Lord gives us the land, we are going to deal faithfully with you. 
This is a suspensive close and it applies both in the workplace and in our lives. What does a suspensive close, a typical one say? It says, after the 25th, I'm going to pay you your salary. An event must come to pass. The date must expire before you receive your salary. There is a suspensive close in your contract. At point number five, as we climax. Now the gentlemen have been let down via the window and they are now at the floor of the, the, the earth on the other side of the, of the wall. She then says to them, gentlemen, you cannot impose upon me a obligation not to disclose our agreements as you remain in the house. There must be a corresponding duty to every obligation that arises. I do not have an obligation not to disclose while you remain in the house. Because as long as you remain in the house, there cannot be a contract. So what is your duty? Your duty is go and hide yourselves in the mountain for three days. Allow me to have a Bible learning moment. What is the Bible learning moment? A long, long time ago, a man went into the mount called Golgotha. Thereat he was crucified. Thereat he was stuffed into another cave on the mountain in the cave which was meant to be the tomb of Joseph. Thereat he hid for three days. And thereafter he resurrected and he was on his way. Should you wish to impose upon heaven, impose upon heaven an obligation to deliver you from death, especially the second death, you have a duty. What is your duty? Hide in the rock of ages that has been cleft for you. Three days, hide in that rock and you will never be the same. May the God of Israel, the God of our forefathers, and your God and my God keep you in the safe and hollow of your hand till we meet again next Monday. Blessings and peace.